This is BBC News. I'm Lucretta Burek. The headlines at five. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, the British Iranian jailed in Iran, begins a new hunger strike in protest against her imprisonment. Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt urges Iran to do the right thing. A man is stabbed to death in East London after four separate London attacks, leaving three people dead and three men injured in the space of 24 hours. Hundreds more people are urged to leave their homes in Lincolnshire because of flooding brought on by heavy rain. A major review of hospital food after the deaths of five patients from Listeria is announced in England. Four-time Tour de France winner Chris Froome posts this picture from his hospital bed and says he's fully focused on getting back to his best after his high-speed crash on Wednesday. Good afternoon. Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, the British Iranian jailed in Iran, has begun a new hunger strike in protest against her imprisonment. Her husband, back in the UK, also plans to join her on hunger strike. The mother of one has been detained for the past three years after being accused of spying by the Iranian authorities, a charge she strongly denies and was sentenced to five years in jail. Well, our correspondent Andy Moore is following the story for us. Her daughter, Gabriella, is in Iran, staying with her parents. She's just recently celebrated her fifth birthday. And Nazanin said that if she was still in prison when her daughter was five, she would go on hunger strike. Uh, so there was an event outside uh, the Iranian embassy in the UK today. And her husband, uh, Richard Radcliffe, said he was going to join that hunger strike. He was going to be outside the embassy, uh, not taking any food, just water, uh, until... Uh, his wife came off her strike. And I think we may be able to uh, hear what he said to me a few hours ago. In fairness, I had had some wind that for her, Gabriella's birthday was a landmark as to, you know, if we went past it, she would do something. She said that before, and I said to the Foreign Office, listen, I think she might have another hunger strike and, and you know, we'll be lucky if we get to the end of the June without one. On the phone this morning, so previous phone calls, she'd been quite tense and, and sort of stressed and, and angry and, 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 you know, distraught. Actually, today she was quite calm. You know, she'd made the decision. She said she sent her letter to the judiciary, so it's now started. Um, and, and yeah, she was quite nervous as how she's handling the phone, but also calm. Um, and we'll see how things go. So, the hunger strike for you, how long may that last? Yeah, as long as she, she goes for it. So, completely unknown territory for me. I've, I've no idea um, how it is. I was, I was saying to other people, I'm glad I've had my breakfast before, before this started. Um, we'll see. Um, you know, obviously. Um, could be a day, could be three days, could be ten days, could be hopefully not much longer, um, and we'll take it one day at a time. So Nazanin has been on hunger strike before earlier this year. About three days on that occasion, she said she wanted uh, medical treatment, so she went on hunger strike brief briefly. Uh, Richard Ratcliffe hasn't been on hunger strike mm. before, but he says he will be outside that embassy camping overnight uh, until uh, his wife ends her strike or until she's released. That was uh, Andy Moore there. Now, Iran is almost certainly responsible for the attacks on two oil tankers in the Gulf of Oman. That's according to the Foreign Secretary, Jeremy Hunt. The U.S. military released this video footage yesterday, which it said proved Iran was behind Thursday's attacks, something Iran has categorically denied. Well, the Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, says there's no credible evidence Iran is responsible, tweeting that the U.K. should ease tensions rather than fuel a military escalation. Nearly 600 homes have now been evacuated in Lincolnshire because of fears a river could burst its banks again. Around 300 homes had already been evacuated after two months of rainfall fell in just two days, with some houses filled with water almost a metre high after the river steeping burst its banks in Wainfleet near Skegness. Well, RAF Chinooks were also called in to drop ballast to bolster the banks. But authorities are saying that water levels are still rising and this afternoon told residents in another 290 homes that they needed to evacuate. Well, earlier, I spoke to the Chief Inspector of Lincolnshire Police, Phil Vickers, who's been helping coordinate efforts, and he updated us on the situation.
The uh, repairs that were completed by the RAF uh, yesterday evening were checked again at first light this morning and although they were holding there was a concern about the volume of water that was seeping through. Um, another crack was found in the bank and the decision was made that uh, the first 290 homes uh, to the area to the west of Wainfleet would be evacuated. Uh, later today uh, we've seen rising water levels particularly around one of the pumping stations uh, that, that serves the area uh, and as a result of that we're concerned that we may lose the, the capability of that pumping station so some further properties have been evacuated. Um, can I just double check where, where the people are being evacuated to? Uh, well, we're asking the majority of people to, to self-evacuate, to stay with friends out of the area. Um, we have prioritised the vulnerable residents in the area and we're providing a, a specific level of support depending on what their needs are. Uh, we do have a, a, a refreshment centre, um, reception centre in Skegness for people who don't have anywhere else to go. Um, and we're treating people according to their needs and, uh, and, and looking at probably the next 24, 48 hours. I mean, obviously this rain has been going on um, for, for the past week. How are the residents feeling? Uh, well, they've responded really well and, and the community are very positive, very supportive uh, and, and have evacuated pretty much as, as we've asked them to um, and they've been really helpful for all of the, the volunteers and the emergency services on the ground. Um, clearly there is concern for the damage to property um, and we're trying to minimise that as far as possible but we're providing local residents with as accurate information as we can in a timely manner. I mean, clearly you must be coordinating with um, weather, weather forecasts. I mean, how much more rain are you expecting across this area that's been so badly affected? Well, the, there's a delay in the impact. So although the weather on the ground today has been relatively dry compared to previous days, um, there's still a large volume of water that's coming through the system. So um, the high volume pumps that we've got in place are helping us to reduce the, the river levels in the area. Um, but we are prepared for potentially an increase overnight. And I say that's why we're planning through the weekend and, and into early next week. OK, like you said, there is a delay there then. I mean, how long or how long does it take before those waters do start to recede? Well, it's, it's going to depend, obviously, on, on the weather in, in a very tight local area. There's a lot of water from the fens that comes out through, uh, the, through the river. Um, so we need to prepare for a number of different contingencies. In, in fairness, the, the high volume pumps that have been put in place uh, are making a real difference to that. But um, it, it's not a precise science and, and we're trying to provide that accurate information as often as we can. Um, I know that you've got the RAF Chinooks who are helping trying to, to, to drop that ballast and the, the gravel to try and shore up those banks. In terms of preparation, do you think you, you'd done as much as you could or were you caught off guard? No, I, I think we've done a lot. I mean, Lincolnshire, um, our highest civil emergency risk is around flooding. So we have worked with local communities, provided them with information about what they could do to be prepared um, as a, um, a group of agencies, both the Blue Light and, and the support agencies. We work together and we exercise around this kind of scenario on a regular basis. So um, our priority is always going to be to save life, to protect people. Um, and, and we're happy with what we've achieved so far. Clearly, it's a significant challenge. Um, we're an RAF county. And, and the support from our military colleagues has been fantastic too. That was Phil Vickers of Lincolnshire Police there. Now, the Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has ordered what he called a root and branch review of hospital food after two more patient deaths were linked to a listeria outbreak. A total of five people have now uh, died. Production has been halted of the sandwiches and salads thought to have caused the outbreak. Lee Milner reports. Five people have now died after eating hospital sandwiches and salads containing listeria. Two lost their lives here at the Manchester Royal Infirmary, another at Aintree Hospital. It's not yet been revealed where the other two patients died, but Public Health England has confirmed that seven trusts across the country have been affected. The Food Standards Agency ourselves are trying to identify how this could have got into the, to the food chain. Um, that is going to take some time to do. But what we have done is um, taken steps to make sure that the product is no longer distributed and therefore the public and the NHS patients um, are safe. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, has now called for a review of NHS food. In a statement, he said, I have been incredibly concerned by this issue and strongly believe that we need a radical new approach to the food that is served in our NHS. Listeria typically causes mild food poisoning, but can prove fatal if people are already seriously ill. The first patient affected showed symptoms on the 25th of April. 
Suspect salads and sandwiches were withdrawn on the 25th of May. Public Health England first warned about the outbreak on the 7th of June. The good food chain, which has been linked to the outbreak, has since voluntarily ceased production. As investigations continue, Public Health England insists any risk to the public remains low. Lee Milner, BBC News. Well, a little earlier, my colleague uh, Gita Guru Murphy spoke to Dr Nick Finn, the Deputy Director of the National Infection Service at Public Health England. We very quickly identified this and on 25th of May the products were withdrawn um, and we've now been running for over two weeks and we've not seen any new cases since then. So that's very encouraging. One of the things we have to be aware of though is that listeriosis has got, uh, listeria has a long incubation period, but we would have expected most cases to have been affected and um, to have appeared by now. Um, and all I can say is that having taken the product off the, the market, um, people can have confidence, certainly, um, that there is no longer a risk from, from that source. These are products that were used um, in, as part of the sandwiches. Um, at the moment, both the, um, the Food Standards Agency ourselves are trying to identify how this could have got into the, to the food chain. Um, that is going to take some time to do. But what we have done is um, taken steps to make sure that the product is no longer distributed and therefore the public and the NHS patients um, are safe. We're fairly confident that now we've identified it and working with the FSA and local authorities, steps have been taken to stop production and um, that this um, issue is, is, is no longer. That was Dr Nick Finn of Public Health England. Now police are investigating after three people were killed in separate attacks in London. A man in his 30s died after being stabbed in Tower Hamlets earlier this afternoon. Now, this follows the deaths of two teenagers yesterday evening. It all comes after police made 14 arrests following four separate attacks in London, which left two teenagers dead and three men injured in the space of 12 hours. Well, our correspondent, Ben Ando, is here. It's really upsetting looking at all these numbers. Um, so bring us up to date on what we know this latest attack in Tower Hamlets. Well, the police were called just before two o'clock this afternoon and told that a man had been found with stab wounds in a park in the Lansbury estate in Poplar. Um, they attended, the ambulance service were called, but uh, they were unable to, to help this man and he was pronounced dead 40 minutes later. Our understanding at the moment is there have been no arrests in connection with this, this latest one. Um, and, and there have been some arrests made in attacks that took place certainly yesterday. That's right, yes. Um, so yesterday afternoon around about uh, 20 to 5 uh, came the first report of another stabbing. This was in Wandsworth in Deeside Road. Uh, police again attended. They found a teenage boy there suffering from stab wounds. Uh, again, they couldn't save him and the ambulance crews couldn't save him. He was pronounced dead at the scene. Um, in connection with that, there have been six uh, young men uh, aged 16 to 19 arrested and questioned. Then a few minutes later, at about 5 to 5, there was a shooting in Plumstead in South East London and the uh, armed police were called. They attended. Again, uh, a man was found with, a teenager was found with gunshot wounds. He died. Um, three people, including one uh, girl aged 16 to 17, have been arrested in connection with that. And the mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, uh, last night tweeted that he was sickened by this latest round of violence. OK, Fernando, thank you very much for that. Thank you. You're watching BBC News. Now, Chris Froome has posted a picture of himself recovering in hospital after his crash in France. It was posted on his Instagram account, and there he said is on the road to recovery following a six-hour operation in Saint-Étienne. He sustained multiple injuries, including fractures to his neck and leg after he crashed at 40 miles an hour whilst testing the course at the Criterium de Dauphine. Now, following huge protests, the leader of Hong Kong has suspended plans to introduce a new law that would allow extraditions to mainland China. The proposals have prompted big demonstrations, including one last Sunday, where organisers said more than a million people took part. Our China correspondent Stephen MacDonald reports from Hong Kong and a warning, his report does contain some flashing images. The large demonstrations just days ago turned into running street battles with the police. It would prove to be the turning point in this standoff. 
The government of Hong Kong has been forced to concede that its controversial extradition bill has prompted ill will and division here. And the announcement came that it would be shelved, at least for the time being. I now announce that the government has decided to suspend the legislative amendment exercise, restart our communication with all sectors of society, do more explanation work and listen to different views of society. However, a vast array of opposition groups say the extradition bill means facing mainland Chinese courts controlled by the Communist Party, which can't guarantee a fair trial. And they say Carrie Lam ultimately still wants it introduced. Hong Kong people won't be cheated by the temporary suspension. Carrie Lam's comments will only make us more angry. The city enjoys freedoms which were guaranteed when the former British colony was handed back to China. A key pillar of those freedoms is having an independent judiciary. That's why for many people here the fight against extradition is a fight for everything this place stands for. And it's why they say they won't give up until the extradition proposal has gone forever. Protests planned for tomorrow will go ahead, with some calling for Carrie Lam to resign. The government the, uh, has not given up yet, so I think we still have to fight for what we want to do, because this is not the end yet. Delay of this bill may provide a truce for now, but with both sides digging in, this relief of pressure could also only be temporary. Stephen MacDonald, BBC News, Hong Kong. The time has just gone, a quarter past five. Time for the headlines on BBC News. And Nazanin Zaghari Ratcliffe, the British Iranian jailed in Iran, has begun a new hunger strike in protest against her imprisonment. Police are investigating after three people were killed in separate attacks in London in the past 24 hours. Hundreds of homes have been evacuated because of flooding in Lincolnshire brought on by heavy rain. Now, the exam board edXL has launched an investigation into how an A-level maths paper was leaked online. Images of the paper were shared on social media ahead of the exam that took place yesterday. Well, Pearson, which runs edXL, said that the images were circulated in a very limited way. It reassured students that no one would be advantaged or disadvantaged and that they would not have to resit the paper. Well, joining me now is uh, Christy Curran, who sat the exam yesterday. And Christy, just to get some clarity on this, there were actually three papers as part of this maths exam. Is that yes. right? Yes. Yes, there's two papers, the first two on pure maths, and the last one, which was the one that was leaked, was stats and mechanics. OK, before we get on to how you feel about what's happened, how much work had you put in for this exam? So, out of all the maths exams, this one the most, definitely. It's, I thought it was the hardest one, so I... Probably, oh, it's hard to gauge, probably 20 hours maybe. Okay, so it's qu quite a lot. So, hearing now that some people may have cheated, how are you feeling? Yeah. A bit upset. It's, you want a level playing field when you're doing an exam. And, like, I went in there and I had seen the paper but scribbled out. I'd seen a diagram on the paper. And then I go into my maths exam and I see the same diagram and I realize that it actually was leaked. And that puts me off for about five, ten minutes, and it's, it's unfair. I've worked so hard. Were the school aware of this? If, if you know, the, 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 the students knew about it, there was, there was gossip going on, people were checking yeah. it out. So, I'm not sure if the school was aware of it or not, but after they definitely were, I, I remember overhearing teachers talking about it. Yeah, I'm not sure. OK, so, so Pearson or EdXL said that uh, the questions or the images were circulated in a very limited way. Is that what you think? Do you agree with what um, you saw? Well, after, after the exam, straight after, they were circulated in a very unlimited way. So, I mean, I saw all of them straight after, which, it, yeah, I, I don't agree with what they've said. I don't believe that. What, what would you like to see happen, Christy, if you don't agree with what they've said? You know, how would you like <sighs> things to pan out? I don't want to do a retake. I've worked so hard and... People are saying there might be a retake. I really hope not. I, I'm not sure how, how they would get, get like make this fair afterwards because 
some people have, have got it easier if they do the make the gray boundaries lower or higher it's, it's affecting everyone so i don't i don't know what do you what do your parents think because obviously they've seen you studying so hard you know you're, you're hoping to go on to university what sort of conversations have you had with them uh, i came in frustrated but i thought i did really well on the exam and i hope that doesn't make it look like i cheated because i didn't but i thought i did really well i've they were proud of me but this, they were annoyed as well, disappointed that this would happen. OK, Christy, come September when those results come in, um, are you going to be happy with whatever result you have despite or rather knowing what happened and that some students would have cheated? Um, if I don't get the grade, I'll, I'll probably be upset. Um, I think I'd be upset with if people had cheated or not if I didn't get the grade, but I will feel hard done by definitely. Are you, um, are, you, are you going to be willing to take it further, do you think, if you don't get the grade? Would you, would you appeal? Hmm. I, if I don't get the grade, I will retake. I have to, because I, I want to go to university. That's where I want to be. So, um, It might be worth appealing, but I don't know what I'd get out of that, really. I don't know what would come from that. OK, I really feel for you, Christy. Um, but yeah. good luck in, in Thank all you. this. Good luck. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Christy Curran there. Back to politics. Six candidates remain in the race to be the next leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister to replace Theresa May. The Health Secretary, Matt Hancock, pulled out of the contest yesterday but is yet to declare who he'll be backing. While the former Foreign Secretary and Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, remains the front-runner and he has confirmed that he'll be taking part in the BBC televised leadership debate on Tuesday with the Emily Maitlis. Well, today, the candidates have been addressing a leadership hustings in central London, where contenders for the Tory crown have been lining up to insist that uh, there must be no unchallenged coronation for Mr Johnson. Here's the former Brexit secretary, Dominic Raab. I, I, I Are you worried that this, uh, the members might be denied a proper contest here well, as well as coronation? They certainly shouldn't be. We've got fantastic uh, members who've just come all the way from all parts of the country down here. It's been great to engage with them. It's their party. They must be given their say and their, uh, and their voice heard. Do you really have a chance or should you leave the field now? Oh, no, I'm uh, just getting started. I'm the candidate I think that can be most trusted to deliver on Brexit. We've got to get Brexit done to deliver a fairer deal for workers, a fairer society, and unite the aspirational working middle class of this country. That's how we get out of this rut. That's how we beat Jeremy. How are you going to stop a Boris Johnson coronation? Well, we should have proper scrutiny of everyone. The longer this goes on, the more the underdog gets their shot. Well, that was Dominic Robb. Uh, meanwhile, after he left the event, the Environment uh, Secretary, Michael Gove, brushed off questions from reporters about his future in the race. It was a hugely positive reception from a, a wonderful audience, uh, critical questions about the future of our country, and it was a pleasure to be able to talk to um, the backbone of our party. You've slipped oh, in second to third. Is this the end of the line? Thank you, Michael. That was that Michael Gove there. Well, we'd like to know, do you have any questions for the next Prime Minister? On Tuesday, BBC One will be hosting that live election hustings between all the candidates that are left standing for Conservative leader. And one of them will be the person who moves into Downing Street. Their debate will be shaped by your questions. So we're asking you, please submit them to us in advance. Email have your say at bbc.co.uk. Uh, include your question as well as your name and contact number if you're interested in asking it live from your local BBC uh, regional studio. Full special coverage, of course, will be on BBC News Channel as well. Now, people from black, Asian and other minority ethnic communities are more at risk of developing some cancers and other life-limiting illnesses, such as kidney failure and type 2 diabetes. They're also less likely to access or be offered hospice care services. So now a new government-funded study aims to increase take-up rates across England. Our community affairs correspondent, Adina Campbell, explains. Now, are you comfortable? Yeah. Now, Retired businessman Dalbar Singh was diagnosed with stage 4 lymphoma two and a half years ago. Part of his health care plan includes coming here to his local hospice in Luton. 
a service he and many others wouldn't normally consider. The concept of the Asian community have of hospice is a place you go to die. I didn't want to come here. There was a certain nurse at the health centre. She said, just try it, Alba, and then, then come and tell me. And I'm so grateful that I came and it's made my life a lot more comfortable. Well, welcome everybody, thanks very much. A new two and a half year study, the first of its kind in the UK, will now look at the improvements needed to encourage more people from Asian, black and other minority groups access this type of care, using more than £400,000 of government funding. There's been quite a lot of, uh, relatively quite a lot of research about establishing that people from minority ethnic communities are disadvantaged in the end of life. There's not a lot about what those disadvantages look like in terms of um, uh, health outcomes. There are many reasons for a low take-up of hospice care services by these communities, including cultural, language and religious differences. And often families take on the full responsibility of care themselves. But some doctors are also unlikely to recommend this kind of support in the first place because of a lack of understanding or fear they may cause offence. The UK is set to become one of the world's most ethnically diverse countries over the next 30 years or so. Take Leicester, for example, and this busy cosmopolitan high street. We hear all the time about the pressures of an ageing population, but there's also an increasing need to ensure our care services also reflect and serve a wide range of cultural groups. These women in Birmingham were brought together through a hospice service which cared for them and their children before they died. I didn't know what hospice was, I didn't have understanding because I had a child before who passed away whose life was mostly spent in children's hospital. The quality of life of one individual is so important to embrace that we need to look at community resources. We learn a lot and now we try to give other people information. The results of the new study will be published in 2021. Researchers say it will help develop real change for ethnic minority groups all over the UK, with specialist training for those working in our care services. Adina Campbell, BBC News.